Thank you for joining us today, everyone. My name is Jody Lee, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar, Better Field Management with NV Analytics and UAS Data Fusion. I'm excited to be joined today by two of our solutions engineers at Harris Corporation, Zach Norman and Jeff McKissick. Also joining us is one of our partners, Asaf Evenpov, who is the software product and support manager at Icarus. I've muted the phone lines for all attendees, so if you have any questions at any point in the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions chat box, and our presenters will try to answer as many as they can at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to mention that a recording of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. Um, it will also be available on our website at www.harrisgeospatial.com, and we encourage you to share it with your colleagues. And now I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker, Zach. Thanks, Jody. Um, as Jody had kind of mentioned, we're going to be talking about field management um, with MD Analytics and UAV Data Fusion. Um, today, um, it's primarily going to be myself um, and my coworker Jeff McKissick um, chatting with you today. Um, here's our contact information. Um, I'm on the left and Jeff is on the right. Um, we're both in uh, Broomfield, Colorado is where we're located. Uh, we enjoy the mountains. So that's what our pictures are for. Um, uh, Asaf Evan Paz will also be talking a little bit today as well. Um, he's with Icarus. Um, that'll probably be in about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so go ahead and get started about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the first thing that we're going to go through is kind of an overview of just Harris Corporation and Harris Geospatial Solutions. The reason that we're going to do that is just because we've gone through a lot of name changes over the years and we want to make sure that um, everybody's up to date with who we are and what we do. Then we're going to go through today's scenario. Um, and so we're going to be talking about uh, all the steps that we went to do what we're going to show today. Um, we're going to talk about MV1 button um, and setting up projects for our data set. And then we're going to use MV's analytics for field management, which is going to be um, classifying the images to identify the invasive species. After that, um, we'll just have a few concluding remarks and have some time for questions at the end as well. Um, and so a recording of the webinar will be sent out. Um, and all the questions that are asked, we will try to answer you. Um, so if we don't answer your questions, um, live during the webinar. Um, somebody should, we'll try to get back to you um, after um, in a follow-up. Otherwise, you have our contact information. Um, feel free to ask us any questions you have. All right, so just a couple slides about Harris Corporation. Uh, about 22,000 employees worldwide, um, lots of engineers and scientists. Um, we're a part of Harris Corporation now. We were Excellus Visual Information Solutions um, until just over a year ago. We were purchased by Harris, um, it was last June. Um, so we're um, the same group of people, the same people that have developed MV and IDL, um, but just a different name. Just kind of give you guys a little bit more information about where we fit in Harris overall. Um, we're under the space and intelligence systems, which is basically just a lot of sensors. Um, and we're in the little geospatial piece, um, which is on the bottom of the image on the left. Um, and we focus primarily on analytics. So some of you may be familiar with stuff that we do, some of our software products. For those of you that aren't, um, here's just kind of a quick high-level overview of what we do. Um, so our main software packages are probably MD and IDL. Um, I spend most of my days programming in IDL. Um, IDL is the interactive data language. Um, MD was primarily written in IDL. Um, and so through IDL, you can access all the tools that MD has available, most of them. Um, MD is the environment for visualizing images. MD is all about raster and image processing. Um, has tons of different tools in there um, for pre-processing, multispectral, hyperspectral data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, additionally, we also have a software package called Jaguar. Um, it's a data ingestion and cat cataloging um, product. Uh, lets you ingest live video streams, overlay vectors of streets and roads on them as well. Uh, lastly, we have Geiger Mode LiDAR. Um, that's the bottom right there. Um, it's just a LiDAR sensor um, that lets you fly higher and faster um, to get even um, more dense point clouds. So it's really set for large area collects. Um, so that's kind of just a quick overview of what we do. 
Um, let's go ahead and jump into MV a little bit. Um, MV is really all about uh, processing and ingesting data. Um, so just a few of the different data formats that MV supports. Um, we've got SAR, that's the crazy looking image in the middle on the bottom. Um, multispectral and hyperspectral as well. Uh, we also support processing of LIDAR products and we have analytics for elevation um, information also. So some of the stuff that we like to do with all of this data and this is what we'll talk about today. Um, here's just a little bit of information I took from our website um, at www.harrisgeospatial.com. <clears throat> um, kind of the primary things, we've got like feature extraction or image segmentation as it's called sometimes. Um, we have registration tools, um, change detection, whether that's image to image or uh, thematic change, which is um, two classification images. Um, we also have tons of classification tools, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, most of all of these analytics are also enabled in the cloud, um, so that's kind of what the little graphic in the bottom right is, if that's kind of where you work. Um, so that's kind of the overview we had for MB. Um, we're going to jump into what we're actually going to be talking about today, which is our scenario. Um, so we're going to be trying to identify the invasive um, species a weed called Ceresia, um, and this is a weed that can be found um, in southeastern U.S., uh, maybe like Texas, Kansas. Um, it was originally introduced as a foraging crop, um, and uh, it's now kind of gotten out of control a little bit. Uh, it chokes out native vegeta vegetation, um, and livestock can't eat it for most of the season. Um, so one of the good things, or the, the, one of the things that makes it easy to identify in scenes is actually that it, it contrasts native plants in the fall. Um, so we'll show this in the actual imagery in a little bit, um, but what that means is that in the fall, um, Ceresia is still green, whereas kind of all the other grasses are starting to turn brown and die. Um, so it's, it's, it's easy to pop out. If you want to find out more information about it, there's a link at the bottom of the slide for you. Um, so kind of the whole workflow to identify where this is in the data, um, originally you know, the first step is getting our data. So this is data that was collected with the drone. Um, it's customer data provided by Urgis. Um, and so you know, we're skipping step one because we already have the data. Um, what we're going to walk through is steps two and three. So we're going to go through the steps of getting everything um, stitched together with MD1 button. And we'll talk more about what one button is in just a second. And then the third step, which is field classification with data fusion. Um, so this is where we actually use the analytics um, that are classification tools that MV ships with. Um, and the data fusion that we're going to be talking about today is with um, some spectral indices combinations. And we'll also talk about other options as well in the conclusion. So to talk a little bit about what MV1 button is, because I didn't include any of that information in our first slides, um, I've just got a couple slides talking about um, drone data and why you need software like MV1 button to actually process it. So one button is a software solution that is actually developed by Icarus. Um, it's a industry leading software package that will generate your ortho mosaics um, of UAV or aerial data. It also works with multispectral data sets as well. So for those of you that are not too familiar with um, UAV data processing, um, there's a few reasons that you need to have image stitching software. The first is that the collection of the data itself um, might have um, inaccuracies in the GPS information. There might be complex viewing geometry. So that's, you know, the way that the sensor or camera was oriented when it actually took the picture. So what image stitching software does is it uses something like a bundle block adjustment um, to go through and try to identify the actual orientations and locations of those sensors when the image was taken. And so with this information, then you can actually stitch everything together. So kind of another reason that you need image stitching software. So here on the left, these are some screenshots taken from MB. Um, we actually have a scene with a couple hundred individual UAB data sets open in MB. Um, and as you can see, you can't get much information out of it. Um, there's not much context for the actual orientation of the sensor. All that MB is really doing is just taking that GPS information and plopping it on a map. 
And this is exactly what MB is supposed to do. Um, but over on the right, we have the ortho mosaic from MB1 button. Um, and this, you know, it's imagery that you can actually work with. Um, so that's going to be, you know, kind of the first part of the webinar is we're going to just talk about how to get your data to that point, and then we're going to discuss the classification techniques, um, which um, there's four different ones that we're actually going to be going through. So we're going to use just a simple raster color slice, which kind of just chops up your image at different data values and gives you a classification. We're going to go through spectral angle mapper and minimum distance um, and support vector machine, which is a little bit more complex. Um, the middle two are, are pretty straightforward. Um, they get kind of kooky to think about um, because of the dimensionality of the data. Um, but the nice thing is about all these tools is that they're easy to use. Um, you don't have to be a remote sensing expert to be able to actually apply them. Um, just be able to interpret the results and understand the settings. So this is all that I have for kind of our intro. Um, we're going to go ahead and kind of jump into setting up a project with one button. So I'm going to go ahead and open one button up. Um, so this is the interface for one button. Um, I still have the project open from this morning. Um, so we're going to go ahead and walk through making a brand new project um, just to show you guys how easy it is. Um, I click on the little new button in the top left corner, and this create new project dialog will appear. Um, for this data set, all I need to specify are the project file and the image folders. So if I click on the dot, dot, dot on the right side of this dialog, um, a little dialog pick file will appear so that I can choose my project. Um, I'm just going to use the same one I had earlier. Um, they have a .smp for the file extension. Um, this is just a generic file extension for one button projects. It's not a, a crazy format. It's just a text file um, that you can open up with any text editor. Image folders is the next thing I'm going to choose. Um, this is going to be in the same location I created my project. Um, it contains um, just a couple hundred images. Um, and so once I hit OK, you'll see this little dialog appear that says, please wait, um, calculating data from images and calculating min-max height and sensor or lens information. So what one button is doing is it's going through and it's reading the metadata information for each one of the images. So it's getting the XYZ locations, and then it's also getting the parameters for the sensor. So it's getting the sensor pixel size and the lens focal length. Um, and so one button does all this for you automatically. I don't need to input anything. Um, so this is where one button is really nice and easy to use. Um, it's not quite one button, more like five or six, um, but just kind of the general idea is that it's easy to use software without much uh, interaction. So at this point, I'm just going to hit OK. And what's going to happen is I'll have this dialog pop up that says identifying camera orientation. So this is doing uh, what's called a, a simple kappa calculation. So it's just trying to figure out the rotation of the images uh, based on the flight path of the UAV from the scene. Um, I get the processing output dialog appears. I'm going to close that from now, and we'll come back to that later. So what I have here in the dialog is once I've made my project, um, I have an Esri base map with little red dots that represent each one of the images um, for this data collection. Um, I can change my base map from world imagery to either a world street map or an open street map. So if we just go ahead and change those, I'll give this a second to catch up. Um, there's not a whole lot of information um, in the street map, uh, the world street map or the open street map. Um, world imagery is probably the best one for this data set. I just collect on the open street map. Wait for that to catch up to the webinar. Okay. So, not too exciting here either. Um, we'll just switch back to the world imagery. So for this, there's um, a couple different um, important uh, interfaces in one button that I'm just going to show um, to quickly help you explore your UAV data. Um, up in the top left, I have this new params dialog. Um, the other thing I do want to mention, this is a, a preview of one button 5.0, um, which should be coming out in about a month or so. Um, 
And so this is this will all be in the, the newest uh, version that's coming out. So if I open up params, just to kind of show you guys, um, this is where I can go through and change different generic settings for how images are matched to one another, how the elevation model and point clouds are generated, how my ortho mosaic is created. Um, I can change all these settings and I can save it as a template, uh, which I can then later restore um, to you know, help me process data even quicker. Another thing to mention, um, up in the top left, one button also has an option to add ground control points or GCPs. Um, if I open up this dialog, it will will let me select a GCP file, that uh, might just be a text file with the locations um, of your GCPs, and then you have to go through and specify where they are in your images. Images is the last dialog we're going to show real quick. So if I go ahead and open this up, we'll zoom out on the left. Um, what I'm going to see um, is I've got a base map on the left, and on the right I've kind of got a preview of where that image is located. So as I go through, if I click on different images, then I'll see on the right-hand side, my images are going to change. So if I come over here on the right, where I know there's some trees and what looks like to be some water, as I change my scene, my image changes as well. Um, the other cool thing about this is that if you have metadata information that might not be the most correct, um, or maybe it's got uh, a bad GPS information, I can take images out of this project. So if I click Remove from Database, um, it'll ask me if I want to delete the image or not. I'm just going to hit No. I can also go through and tweak the rotation of all my images. So if you really want to, um, you can go through and adjust this information. It's not needed. Um, there's actually a step that happens behind the scenes in the processing to make sure that the image orientations are really accurate before the bundle block adjustment takes place. All right. So last, I just want to talk a little bit about the output options, um, and then we're going to go ahead and show what the results look like, because processing takes a while for this. Um, to open up the output options, um, there's this uh, little output section at the top left of the screen, and if I just click on the little button, um, I'll have this dialog appear. So there's six, six different um, outputs that I can produce with one button. A GeoTIFF image map which is just through ortho mosaic. Uh, rapid image map is just a very quick processing of your data to quickly throw things together and take a look at um, if you've covered the area of interest that you, you need or not. So it's like something if you're out in the field, um, so you can double check before you get back to the office that you've uh, collected the image you need. Dense geotiff terrain. Um, this is uh, just a, a high resolution surface model of your data set. 3D sparse point cloud and 3D dense point cloud. Um, what we processed for this data set was a 3D dense point cloud. Um, and that's got uh, one point per every three pixels, essentially. Um, there's also an Esri mosaic data set for the output, too. So one of the other things that one button produces once it runs processing is that it will give you a project report. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up for this data set. Um, in the efforts of time. So after one button completes its processing, you'll see something like this. So it'll say Icarus one button processing report. It will tell you the version of one button in the top right corner. Also lets you know the camera make, camera model, um, the area of your project, the pixel size. Um, also tells you about the processing results. So when you started processing, when you stopped processing, how many images were actually processed. Um, it lets you know some other information about the RMS error um, for the project as well. Um, so for this, um, we also get a little snapshot. On the left, we've got our ortho mosaic, and on the right, we have um, our surface model. So the right is just kind of, a, it's, a, it, uh, it's similar to the point cloud, um, but it's just a 2D representation. Um, you know, like the image on the left, you would have no idea that uh, that lake was actually kind of like a part of a, a drainage basin. basin. Um, you know, you, you can't tell that from just imagery, so that elevation information really adds some context to our scene. A few other things worth mentioning about the report from one button. Um, there's a image initial and calculated locations 
Um, and basically what this does is it's got blue dots for where the GPS information says your file, or your, your uh, images should have been taken, and the red dots are where the bundle block adjustment says they really work. Um, another thing to mention too uh, is the coverage map. So this is a really useful tool. Um, it lets you know approximately how many images um, have taken pixel, pictures or have pixels over the exact same area in your scene. Um, this is a really good data collection. Um, so it's a, in a great, uh, a nice gridded pattern um, with excellent overlap um, for the entire scene. Last thing I want to show is just the connection map. Um, so what this does is it's a visual representation of the number of type points that are found between images. So because the um, images have really high overlap, um, this is just a, it's black with little red lines and blue dots. So all that's saying is that there's so many connections found between all the neighboring images um, that you know you, you can't see much else um, in that little screen. So that means that's a good thing. Um, we want to make sure that we have um, those thicker black lines go between our blue dots, um, which means that uh, tie points were found and our solution is probably better. All right. So one more thing I want to show real quick is just the ortho mosaic in NB itself. Um, so to talk a little bit about NB, if this is your first time seeing it, um, it might be pretty similar in appearance to ArcMap. On the left, I've got my layer manager, which just lets me know the different um, images I have open. On the right, I have my toolbox, and in the middle, I've got NB's main display window. Um, I can click and zoom around a little bit. Um, in the display window, I can move the image around. Um, at the top, I've got all of my, some other tools available to me as well. Layer manager, it's really easy to turn layers on and off if I want to. Um, so let's go ahead and just zoom in on the data set here real quick. Um, just kind of pan around a little um, so you guys can see the quality of the ortho mosaic. Um, we'll look around some of the edges here because typically that's where you might have some edge artifacts or warping. Uh, but for this data set, it actually did a really good job. Um, not many artifacts uh, that you can see. Okay. So last thing I want to mention, um, for all of this analysis, we're actually just using a small chunk of this data set. So if I come over here, you'll see this kind of vague blue out outline um, around the image that I just opened. Um, that blue outline is going to be kind of the, the area of interest that we're going to be working with. Um, all of the other images, um, the reason that we did this was just to increase processing time so we can show a couple of the tools live. Um, so this is also just a smaller uh, representation of our scene as well. All right, so that's all that I'm going to be talking about. Um, we're actually going to switch over to Asaf here for just a few minutes. He's going to talk about um, one of the new features for one button um, for batch processing. Hey, Zach. Thank you. Thank you for uh, um, inviting me to this uh, webinar. Yeah, I want to share a couple of minutes about uh, something that some of our clients have asked and uh, need to know. And this is running one button from the command line. Um, as you showed, Zach, you can create a project on your own, enter uh, some information, um, and then let it run. You can do uh, basically the same thing just from a command line, and then um, have it run on servers or on on, uh, on Amazon, for example. So um, the command line is uh, pretty basic, not very complicated. It just needs the uh, one button uh, executable and then uh, kinds of uh, flags with information uh, metadata that we need for the project. Uh, so if we go into the next slide, you can get some explanation about all these different flags. We, we start off with um, the project file path and directory and the project name. And then we have all types of uh, predefined templates um, where the software defaults based on the application and the project type. Um, and again, this is based on our experience with uh, aerial imagery and how the software uh, works. So we have all kinds of uh, predefined, uh, such as agriculture, urban mapping, uh, construction. And again, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, 
we obviously need to know where the uh, images are, so we need to give it the folder path, and we need a GPS file, which includes the image names and the X, Y, and Z uh, coordinates. If you also have rotation angles, then you can feel free to add that in, but it's not uh, necessary. Um, we also need some basic information about the sensor, the focal length, and the pixel size. And we do need some, again, estimated information about the um, ground elevation, uh, the minimum and maximum. And then the final flag, obviously, you want to run um, this uh, one button after you create uh, the project. We also have some additional uh, flags that you can also use. Um, Zach, if you move to the next slide. It's switching. Just take a second. Okay, sure. So um, you can also choose to exit. So after the um, project finishes, uh, you can just have the one button closed. Uh, and uh, we also integrate with um, Summit Evolution uh, from a company called Datum. And this is a software for extracting uh, 2D and 3D uh, vectors from imagery. Um, so um, through that process, we basically duplicate uh, some of the results for that integration. So you can skip that and save some uh, disk space if, uh, if you need. Uh, and that's basically it. We are uh, working together with uh, Harris and Envy to uh, integrate this um, whole interface and whole um, cloud infrastructure, um, um, and we hope to have that ready uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, so you know, keep keep uh, keep your ears out. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, thanks, Asaf. Um, all right, so we're going to jump into the image classification piece of the webinar. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Jeff, um, and we'll start going. Thanks, Asaf. Thanks, Zach. Like I said, I also work for Harris. I'm a solutions engineer, and I'm going to be walking you guys through some of our classification techniques. I'm going to go over some of our visualization techniques and how we look at our data and explore it, and then we're going to start a few classifications as Zach stated before. So I'm going to start off, um, as Zach said before, um, our invasive species is Ceresia. Um, in the summer months, as you can see in this image right here, everything looks pretty green. Um, there's not too much standing out except some of these darker greens. If you look at our September image when most of our grass is dying off, we have this darker green color. Um, it helps us kind of look at our data a little better. The Ceresia sticks out a little more. Um, so right down here, we have a um, our customer told us what to look for and how our Ceresia is going to look. Uh, this darker green color is what we're going to be looking for in our image. We have a few tools we're going to go through that help us kind of see this a little better. The first one is going to be our stretch tool. So up here at the top, we have a list of about eight or nine stretches. Um, I'm going to choose linear 2% and also this tool, our histogram stretch. So what this is showing is our red, green, and blue bands. And as we switch through these options, it will update automatically on its own. And what we're going to be using is this linear 5%. And what this is doing is just cropping off our top 5%, top and bottom 5% values and giving us everything in between. So it's a little easier to look at this. Um, I'm going to close that tool and kind of pan around a little bit for you guys. Um, we know that our Ceresia is this dark green color. So the next couple of tools we're going to use are going to try and visualize that, and then we'll do some classification techniques to really extract that data. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, run a spectral index on our data. If you come up here to our toolbox and you type in spectral, our spectral indexes tool will show up. We double click on that. We're going to use our September image. And we get this nice little dialog coming up. So what this task is doing is creating a spectral index with one or more bands where each band is going to represent a different spectral index. The first dialog is asking you for your input raster. So we chose our September. And then it queries the spectral indexes that are going to be available for that specific data set. So the NV comes packaged with about 66 different spectral indexes, but you see here we only have three. This is due to our strictly RGB data, and 
the wavelength information associated with that. So if we had a lot more bands, we would have a lot more spectral indexes to choose from. So I'm going to go ahead and choose my first three, click OK, and our result is going to spit out this nice, pretty, colorful picture with our three RGB bands. And what NV is doing in the background here is assuming our RGB and applying each of our three spectral indexes to one of those color bands. So here we can see, once it loads, that our red-green ratio index is going to be our red band, our some green index, our green band, and our visible atmospherically resistant band is going to be in the blue. So as you can see in this nice image, our blue is going to kind of accentuate that cerecia color. So we know that greenish color is our cerecia. If I go to our original image, turn it back on, the blue does a pretty good job. I'm going to kind of explore our scene a little more. So we know down here in this little image with the kind of orange circle in the middle that our cerecia is that green around it. So if I flip back to our original image, you see the green and if I turn our spectral indexes on, that blue really accentuates it pretty well. So the next um, tool we're going to kind of run through is going to be our band animation tool. So if I come over to our spectral indexes layer right here and I right click and I click on band animation, it's going to open up this little dialog here. Let me kind of expand it. And what this is doing is running through those three spectral indexes we had. Let me throw an annotation on there for you so we know exactly what band we're looking at. So I'm going to let this run for you guys for a couple seconds just to get a visual of what our scene is doing. So this is running an animation and displaying each of our bands and showing the spectral index associated with each one. As we can see in that first one, the red-green index, um, our species starts out really dark, and then as it goes through the next two indexes, it gets lighter and lighter. So what we're going to try and do from this next is visualize our data and really load a few different band combinations in and see if we can pick out which structural index we want to use to really classify this image. So as we just discussed, that red-green really seems to pop out that cerecia and that dark color. So when we come to our classification techniques here in a minute, we're going to use that band. So I'm going to go ahead and close our band animation tool. And prior to this webinar, we um, layer band stacked um, a metaspectral image that I'm going to load real quick. And if you see in our data manager right here, we have our RGB as our bands 1, 2, and 3. And our three spectral indexes will be the next three uh, bands. So what we're going to do is just we're going to load two separate band combinations, and this is strictly for just visual representation to see if we can identify exactly where that Shirisia species is. So the first band stack I'm going to use is going to be our visible atmospherically resistant index, our blue band is our green band, and we'll pick, let's say, our red band for blue. If we go ahead and load in our data, it'll come up with this nice little red-blue image. And if we scroll to where we know we have our Shrecia, I'll go ahead and flip back to our original image. That red color should pop out pretty well as the green Shrecia we're looking for. So if you want to keep looking as we scroll throughout the image, some of that green information should come out in red. I'm going to go ahead and flip through it a couple times for you guys just to see exactly what we're looking at. So we're going to end up running one more band combination just for one more visualization. And if we come back to our data manager, uh, we're going to click on our red-green index, or our some green index. Our red-green, and then we'll choose our green band. 
If you click load data once more, it's going to load a nice pretty picture with a few colors. Um, and this one, our purple, is going to be accentuating our invasive species, where the rest of the image in green should be either our dirt or grass that's not invasive. So if I sit here and compare it to our original image in September, that green color should really pop out as what we see in orange here. So kind of scrolling through our image a little more, we come to our area where we know we have that invasive species here in the left-hand corner. Look at the screen render real quick on the webinar for you. And if I click that on and off, that green really pops out as that purple color. So those are just some of our visualization techniques. Um, next, we're going to get into some of our actual classifications. So first thing I'm going to do is kind of clean up my layer manager, just get some of this clutter out of here so we don't get confused on exactly what we're looking at. So I'm going to remove my spectral or my band combinations that we went over, and we're going to run a raster color slice, and we're going to do this on our meta spectral image. So if we go ahead and right click on that the player and the layer manager, we click new raster color slice. And as we discussed before, when we were looking at that band animation, our red-green ratio index seemed to really pop out those darker colors that we identified to be our invasive species. So we're going to go ahead and do it on that index right there. We go ahead and click OK. And what this is doing is it's pulling up our image and it's, it's associating different raster values to the values we have in our data. So everything we can see looks pretty blue, don't really see too much. So what we did, we went ahead and identified our data values that associated with our invasive species previous to this webinar. So we're going to try and create a class for that based on those values. So the first thing we want to do is clear all these default color slices. So if we click that little four X's button right there, everything should go away and we're going to add our own. We came up with our values for our invasive species being around 0 0.7 to 0 0.95. So if we plug that in and we show our original image, we can see that most of the scene's darker green colors will be highlighted with that red class we just created. So previous to this webinar, we, um, our customer that provided us with this data, um, we created a ROI training set. ROIs are just regions of interest that um, help classify an image. So I'm going to pull those over real quick, and we're going to load it on our metaspectral data set. So if you go ahead and look at these little rectangles we drew, these are going to be our ROIs or our regions of interest. Uh, we want to kind of classify each class that we're trying to pick out by doing a couple of these for areas that we know. So we went through a couple of our visualization techniques. We kind of did some band combinations, picked out what our invasive species is looking like. So now we're going to make some ROIs for what we know we are looking for and apply those. So we also made a couple different ROIs for just our bare earth, our grass, um, stuff like that. If you come up here, we have this other tree shoe spot we know, and then this blue color down here, I'll let the screen render a little bit. The blue rectangles are going to be our grass that's not Shreesia. All right, so I'm going to jump into our three classification techniques we're going to talk about today. As Zach stated, it is going to be our spectral angle mapper, our minimum distance, and our support vector machine. So the first one we're going to do is our spectral angle mapper. So once again, in our toolbox over here, we have a classification folder. If we go ahead and open that up, we're going to be doing supervised classification techniques. And the first one we're going to do is our spectral angle mapper. So this is going to come up with a dialog for us to input what raster we're using. We're going to use that band stack we previously created. 
click OK, and, and this dialog will come up. If you go to Import, this is where we're going to load in those regions of interest that we created for our training set. So if we select the three of those, click OK. This tool is also really good for algorithms, so we already chose our spectral angle mapper, but when we want to go ahead and do another classification like maximum likelihood or minimum distance, we don't have to open and close a bunch of dialogues or click a bunch of buttons. We can just come back here and change our algorithm and run it again. So I'm going to go ahead and run that first one. Choose our output file name. I'm just going to call it our spectral angle mapper class. I'm not going to run an output rule image just for processing time. It'll take a little longer, so I'm going to click no right there. And if I click OK, it should start running. And what this is doing is running an algorithm that's determining the spectral similarity between two spectra by calculating the angle between them and treating them as vectors of space. Spectral angle mapper compares the angle between the n-member spectrum vector and each pixel vector in 2 or 3D space. So smaller angles are going to represent a closer match, whereas further pixels away from the specified maximum angle threshold are not going to be classified. Basically, this is taking our x, y, and z planes and applying our red, green, and blue bands to them and calculating the difference between any two vectors or bands. So once this loads for you, as you can see, we have this nice image of our, our three classes. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom left-hand corner where we know we have our invasive species. And if I compare this to our original image, it seems to have done a pretty good job of classifying that dark green material as our yellow invasive species, Cerisia. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit for you guys, let you get a closer look. Let it switch back and forth for you before we do our second classification. So it did a pretty good job, um, but we're going to run two more classifications and see if we can get better or different results. So if I come back here to our end member collection dialog, like I said, we have our ROIs already loaded in here. So all we have to do is come up to algorithm, change it to minimum distance, click apply and then our dialog will come up for our parameters. I am just going to call this our minimum distance class. I'm going to open it up. Once again, for processing time, I'm not going to output a rule image. And if I click OK, it should start running through our classification. And what this classification algorithm is doing is using the mean value vectors of each end member and calculating the Euclidean distance from each unknown pixel to the mean vector value for each class. Each pixel is being classified as the near, to the nearest class unless a threshold is applied. So as we discussed with our spectral angle mapper, we are setting our bands 1, 2, and 3 to our x, y, and z values. And instead of measuring that angle difference between the two vectors, we're just measuring the difference between each vector and classifying it to the closest mean value class. So I'll give this one second to open up for you guys. We should have a similar looking image, similar colors. And as previous, our Cerisia invasive species is going to be this yellow color. So I'm going to go ahead and compare this once more to our original image. And as we can see, it does a pretty good job of identifying that darker green material as our invasive species. So let's go ahead and scroll around our scene a little bit, um, see how well it did in other parts. We come up here. We knew that this area up here with the dark green in our original image was our invasive species. So if I go ahead and look at our original image, go back and forth, that yellow did a pretty good job of identifying most of that feature class. So we're going to do one more classification, and this is going to be our support vector machine. It's a little more complicated and a lot more slow, so we're just going to go through setting up that classification and I'll pull the output we came up with previously into this webinar. So if I go back over to our toolbox in our classification folder, our last one, support vector machine, if I go ahead and open that up, we're going to run it on the same metaspectral data set that we created before. Click OK. 
and we're going to load in those same ROIs and output it as our support vector machine class. So we're not going to actually run this, but this is the process you would go through into opening it up. So let me pull open our image real quick for what we came up with. So this is the image that we outputted. Uh, this advanced classification technique is a little more complicated than the previous two, like I said. Instead of just using one simple metric to determine the class you belong to, the support vector machine takes a look at our data set as a whole and tries to determine the boundaries that separate our classes from one another. For example, with two bands, our support vector machine will try, try to find a line that separates one class from another. For three bands, there will be a plane that separates the classes from one another. This differentiator for each class is called the optimal hyperplane. So the points closest to this boundary are going to be the ones most important to our training data set. So this looks a little different than our previous two. Um, we use a different color palette. But if we zoom down to our left-hand corner where we know our invasive species is, if I turn it off and compare it to our original image, that blue color should represent our darker green material. So I'm going to go ahead and compare the three results. Uh, we can do this in a variety of ways, but I'm just going to flip back and forth between the three and only have our classes turned on for our invasive material. So what I'm doing right now on the layer manager is just switching off those uh, class data sets. So all we're going to see is the invasive material on top of our original image. So, since we know this is where our material is most identifiable, we're going to look at our spectral support vector machine classification. Uh, this did a pretty good job, as we can tell. Um, it, however, it's pretty blotchy. It may have overclassified some of our features. If I switch that to our minimum distance, it's going to be a little less blotchy, a couple more holes, and um, a little better classification. And then switching to our spectral angle mapper, this is probably going to be our best result. It's got um, more holes than the previous one. It probably classified a little better if we look at our whole scene compared to our original image. Most of that dark green material is identified pretty well as our Sericia class. So that's all I have for you on our classification techniques. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Zach to have some concluding remarks, and we'll answer any questions you have. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I've just got a couple slides before we're, we go to questions um, to kind of summarize things a little bit that we were talking about today. Um, so as far as, you know, the MD Analytics piece goes, you know, with, with only RGB data, we were able to um, find the most likely places where we could probably find this invasive species to reach out. Um, and so that's all because we were using our data fusion. So like with this example, our, our fusion was combining just spectral indices with our original data. And you know, kind of like a big step of this, like going through, exploring, visualizing your data um, with those different band combinations is really just to make sure that you can identify what you want to find in your schemes. As long as you can find it with those kooky band combinations, those crazy colors, then you can probably find it with classifications. For each one of our classifiers, um, the ones that we looked at all performed pretty well. Uh, you know, like the raster color slice was super easy. Um, a support vector machine, or SVM, might have overclassified things a little bit. Um, spectral angle mapper um, had quite a few little holes. We kind of jumped pretty quick through those classifications at the end. Um, one of the big things is the SVM is very slow. So uh, spectral angle mapper and minimum distance took about 45 seconds. A uh, support vector machine takes about an hour, uh, so it's not um, it's not a super fast process. So kind of where we left this off today, um, I do just want to talk about some other things as well, other tools that Emmy has available for where you might go next. Um, one of the really important things is if you do have ground truth data or you manually go through and create some regions of interest, you can use a confusion matrix to actually assess the accuracy of each one of the classifications. Um, so this is really useful. Then you can actually check to see if you did things the right way. Maybe you need to change your 
ROIs that you're using for your training data. Um, additionally, uh, as far as the, um, the data fusion goes, you can use elevation information. You can use anything um, when it comes to data fusion, as long as it's a raster. Um, so like when we start talking about like spectral similarities and things like that, you know, it gets a little different than, you know, if you just have like a eight band image um, where each one of your bands are actual wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you know, here our data fusion combines information that doesn't represent wavelengths of light. Um, so, you know, that's where all of MB's classification tools work with, with um, all this different information. It's the, the same type of analysis, just with uh, different uh, information being input to the algorithms. Um, additionally, there's an algorithm called Winner Tapes All that's worth mentioning. Um, it's in the Spirit or Cat tool. Um, basically, what this does is if you have a lot of different classification images, you can compare them all against each other to kind of almost combine them together to figure out what the, uh, um, you know, if a pixel has three different classifications, two of them are the same and one are not, then it would classify it as the one where it has the two same classifications. Um, so that's another way to clean up your tools or the, the classification results. Additionally, um, MV has tons of classification cleanup tools. Um, there's for classification smoothing, aggregation, seeding. Um, so those are all great ways to clean things up. Um, with classification seeding, you can throw out smaller clumps and only focus on larger areas um, where you might need to go do some sort of a mitigation. Um, so that's all that we have for today. Um, this is, uh, here's our concluding remarks. Um, you know, here's our contact information again. Um, I think we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jody to answer a few questions. Um, the other thing I do want to mention as well is that if we don't get to your question um, here live in the webinar, um, somebody should be following up with you. Um, we'll send out like an FAQ, um, and then uh, if you guys need a question answered, you can always reach back to us. Great. Thank you, Zach, Jeff, and Asaf for the informative presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, and I see a couple that have already come in, so we'll get started. Can one button extract images from video? Um, so this is a soft. If the video is broken up into separate frames, then yes. However, we um, would not recommend doing it unless you have a very high resolution uh, video, because the resolution is usually very, very low, so results will not be optimal. Okay, um, and I noticed you're using a PC for the app. Um, does it work on Macs to run the app as well? So I'll refer to uh, the one button. One button currently only works on uh, Windows. Um, Zach? Yeah, MV and IDL are both enabled for um, Mac and Linux. Okay, great. Can any of these NV tools be automated? Uh, yes, most of the stuff that we showed today can be automated, um, but the only exception to that is the support vector machine. Um, that's one that just has um, a button in MV to do that. Um, but everything else can be automated with IDL. It can be enabled in the cloud um, for you know complete automated processing. All right. Um, the next question. Can you, re can you remove buildings and trees from DSM in one button to get a bare earth surface model? You can do that in the professional version, not in the standard version. Uh, but yes, that is uh, a feature. The other thing that I'd like to add to that, um, if you do have a point cloud, um, you can actually use uh, MV's LiDAR processing to get your surface model and then your bare earth or elevation model as well. Okay. Um, what level of training does one need for the software? Are there tutorials or videos? Uh, there's tutorials. There's a handful of webinars, and I think there might be some videos out there as well. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but it's really easy to use. You know, a lot of the tools, you don't have to be a remote sensing expert to actually use them. Um, there's lots of easy access to help. So almost every workflow and dialog has either a little blue question mark in the bottom left corner or a little help button. 
um, that brings up the documentation for exactly where you're at. So it makes it really easy to use and learn about the tools um, without needing to understand everything about remote sensing. So I see a lot of different questions about thermal imagery. Um, I mean, one question is, have you completed any analysis with thermal imagery? Does one button work with it? So let's start off with one button, then Zach, I'll let you answer. Um, with uh, release five, um, we will be able to integrate with uh, FLIR, uh, TAU, and um, um, some other FLIR sensors. We already integrate with uh, the Genoptic uh, thermal sensor. Yeah, I think there was one question about um, processing or calibrating thermal mosaics. So in MB, you do have band math tools. So if you do have thermal data in MB and you want to convert um, from your pixels values to like degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, um, you can do that in MB. Great. Um. All right. Do you use ground control points in this project? If so, how dense is the ground control or how many ground control points used? We didn't use any ground control points. Um, one button is usually pretty um, uh, accurate as far as the positioning of the images. Uh, do you have the like specific numbers, Asa? Um, so, if you looked at the report, the average error was around one pixel, and what was the ground resolution? A couple of centimeters? Uh, Zach? Uh, yeah, I think it was about three centimeters. So, I would say for this project, the accuracy would be somewhere around the five centimeter um, accuracy on the XY. If you have ground control points, then it's all a matter of the accuracy of your control points. Rule of thumb, uh, if you want to get very highly accurate uh, results, um, is that you add a control point for each three um, images. So I know that can be a lot, but uh, that's the rule of thumb. Zach, this question's for you. Is, is there a UAV toolkit in regular Envy, not one button? Uh, there. I actually wrote some code with IDL, um, which is called the UAV Toolkit. Um, it's for processing uh, the multispectral sensor uh, Micasense Red Edge, um, getting that data ready for ingestion in, um, in uh, one button or, or other image imaging software. OK, um, maybe just a couple more questions. Uh, how high resolution? For the video, do they need? <laughs> um, the higher, the better. Um, I don't know. I think uh, we haven't had a lot of uh, thermal. Uh, sorry, we haven't had a lot of video uh, imagery, um, so I can't really comment. Uh, I'll be happy to if they send me some samples to look at it. Okay. Um. I think, you know, so the rest of them then we can put, the rest of these questions we'll put in the Q&A and answer them and send them out to everybody who's registered for this webinar. Um, with that, we're just going to wrap up. So I thank everyone for their attention on the line and thank Zach, Jeff, and Asaf for presenting again. Um, a recording will be provided um, via email tomorrow with a link to the webinar, the PowerPoint, and um, we encourage you to share it with your colleagues. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.